Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, dear listeners. This is Brett. I am the producer of the Online Great Books Podcast. Not the same Brett who suggested this book, by the way. In case anyone was thinking, how many Bretts could there be? At least two, and the one who suggested the book is a different man. But this is part two of the discussion of that book, Philip Reef's Triumph of the Therapeutic. Please make sure you caught part one. Scott and Carl just finished talking about Shakespeare, and now they move on to Freud. Thanks for listening. And then Freud. (laughs) People are going to hate me so much for this. Change the way people experience themselves. You know, people talk about it all the time, like, oh, I'm OCD or he's anal or whatever. I mean, it's crazy that people people talk about themselves in these terms without any irony whatsoever. And then new, new psychiatric psychological pathology has crept into people's own experience of themselves. Like, oh, he's autistic, but he's not, right? He's just a particular guy who is an engineer and is very process-driven and wants to make sure the bridge doesn't fall down. Everything is pathologized now, and the way people experience themselves is completely broken. I mean, it has been the triumph of the therapeutic. But he doesn't talk about this. I think there is, I don't think he talks about this. There is a reward, a therapeutic reward in, and you, you gave some categories, OCD or whatever, uh, if you put yourself in a category right. and now you can be treated and you can talk about it, you have something to talk about. Your stupid behavior is explicable now. Well, and it's it's not neutral. It it makes you feel good to talk about it. And so there's a motive actually, I believe, to find yourself in these situations. Right. Whereas uh, my my Julius Caesar example, I think he would have thought it was ridiculous. You know, I'm Caesar. <laughs> I'm doing what Caesar does. Caesar is ambitious, says Shakespeare. Hmm. Was this ambition? So were those Stoics actually Stoic, or were they just pre-Shakespearean contemporary people who didn't see themselves in terms of their emotional responses and had a different, entirely different experience of their internal life? Yeah, now I need to argue with myself, because you find a lot of this hand-wringing in Seneca. Maybe I'm not quite right on that. Maybe Caesar did have dads. Doesn't seem like it. Aurelius did, I think. Yeah. I mean, his book is about dealing with those doubts. Yeah, well, that's what this show's about, me arguing with me. Is it my id arguing with my superego? I don't know. What's the third one? Interego. Interego? I don't know. It's a long time. My subconscious? You see, your soul has three parts, Carl. And they're all struggling for dominance, you see. What are you talking about? Like, what's the avid evidence? Like, you got to get the metaphysics right, right? Or you get in weird mm-hmm. places. Like, what is the evidence that the soul has three parts? Like, what is he talking about? <laughs> it's just a heuristic. It's just a way of thinking about these different urges and these sort of unresolved problems that he perceived. Rubbish. Yeah, let's do this. So this is some Freud stuff. Uh, Bottom of 26 into 27. It was not always the case, but nowadays in the circumstances of modernity, to be religious is, he thought, to be sick. It is an effort to find a cure where no one can possibly survive. For Freud, religious questions induce the very symptoms they seek to cure. The moment a man questions the meaning and value of life, Freud wrote in a letter to Marie Bonaparte, he is sick, since objectively, neither has any existence. The meaning and value of life, neither of them have any objective existence. That's nihilism. Yeah. So all you do is come to terms with that. That's be the therapeutic attitude. But what Reef is good at showing is that this, uh, it's, it's not good enough. It's not good enough, which is why people come up with salvific forms of psychoanalysis. Because you have to put something in the god hole. Yep. 
Maybe Freud didn't need it, but most people do. How dare you? I love that. St. Greta Thunberg, or whatever her name is. I, I never heard of her. No idea what you're talking about. This stuff right here is so interesting to me because, you know, not a lot of people have read Freud. I mean, a lot of people have, but more people have read just almost anything else. <laughs> no, well, they have trickle-down Freud. Trickle-down Freud. Well, yeah, but this philosophy stuff matters. These ideas matter for good or worse. We are swimming in a soup made of that stuff. And, you know, the, the, the comment commenter in Slack that was saying that Aristotle reading Aristotle's metaphysics didn't change anybody, which was, and to him that was evidence that it was of less value. Uh, I said that one of the reasons, if it didn't change you, you either one, didn't read it very well, or two, were already Aristotelian and didn't know it, right? Like so much of his stuff is already baked in. Anyway, mm -hmm. these philosophies and ideas are all around us, whether you like it or not. If Freudianism is around us, and what, and some of his bedrock assumptions are that the man is sick because he questions the meaning and value of life, and quote, objectively neither has any existence. You know, we need to consider whether or not he should be seeping on in. You know, we need to, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how weaselly. I don't think that the guy, I don't know, I never met Freud, but he's not stupid. I've got to think if we were in the room together, we could get over our language problems and say, hey, now listen, you said objectively, neither has any existence. You know, what is your proof for that? He would probably come off of it in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, would be my guess, but it's there and it underlies all all of his work, and now it's just seeped into everything that we do. I mean, we live in a therapeutic society with yeah. a therapeutic con uh, concept of self, and it was invented by a guy that thinks that my life and death have no meaning. So I would probably ask him if this is the case, Dr. Freud, why should I seek therapy? Uh, to have a good time now. I mean, that's what he would say. Yeah, but good time would be meaning and value of life. So, in other words, why do why do the therapeutic mm -hmm. practice at all if there's no? So I don't quite believe him on this. Uh, you would not do what he did and listen to Anna talk about her dreams or whatever. You know, what's the point of doing it all? Is to because you think you're going to help. Help is a positive good. That means you must believe there is a positive good. Yeah, even if you think it's just to make sure somebody's having the good times. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I have this puzzle with Buddha and Buddhism, and I have not argued with Buddhists about this, but maybe I should. So I, so I read this stuff about how suffering is a is the big problem, and the, the, the key is to eliminate suffering. And then I read about this guy's life, and he went and he preached. I'm thinking, why did he bother? You know, if uh, if you can get rid of suffering, wouldn't the highest good be inactivity? And so I question and I say, well, I mean, Buddhists, it's an ancient religion. They can come up with their answers and tell me how I get not quite getting it right. But if suffering was the ultimate evil, I would just sit on the mountaintop and not do anything. Right. I wouldn't go try to tell other people to enlighten them because that's going to lead me to suffering. Yeah. So I don't know that he actually believed that or if... if I, I, I think they're talking about like uh, aggr aggregate amount of universal suffering. Like your suffering is but a little, a drop in the ocean of suffering and the ocean must be stemmed. Hmm. I think. Well then we've got more going on than the, the self and getting rid of suffering. So. Right. <sighs> That's what I'm trying to do with Freud. I don't believe him on this point because he would not have tried to help all those people if he didn't think life had value. So you're asking questions of Freud like, if what you say is true, why are you burning the calories to help this lady? Yeah. 
if life is devoid of meaning, then who cares? I mean, that's a very Socratic question. Mm hmm. It's my job. That's our job. All of us. All of us. <laughs> yeah, I liked on the top of 33, I wrote consumer above it. Top of 33, psychological man may be going nowhere, but he aims to achieve a certain speed and certainty in going. Like his predecessor, the man of the market economy, he understands morality as that which is condu conducive to increased activity. The important thing is to keep going. Yeah, that rings true. This whole section here, he says, uh, to lay out the psychological man for an anatomy lesson as economic man has been laid out, his anxious Protestant heart, his open enlightenment eyes, his democratic accents dissected and probed now by every student doctor of the social sciences. Yeah, the, the, the modern man with his Protestant heart, open enlightenment eyes, democratic ascents. Yeah. You didn't like this book? <laughs> this is some good lines in here. It's evocative of the McIntyre book. It's really upsetting. And he's he's dead on. His writing style is way more difficult than need be, I think. But he's right on, you know, uh, unlike McIntyre. You know, McIntyre gives us that last chapter. You know, he says there's hope. You know, you can find Telos mm -hmm. in your small community and reconstruct virtue. He says you, you can, it can be done. Reef does not give us that. No. Uh, take a look at page 35, uh, where he starts talking about Jung. Mm -hmm. It is not the repressions that trouble us now, but the permissions. It is the meaninglessness of life that causes the disturbance in the unconscious. Everybody's gotten rid of all their repressions. If you haven't, you weren't trying. It's easy. We were talking about TikTok earlier. Mm -hmm. And our, you brought up TikTok, not me. In the uh, I've never TikToked in our music and ideas podcast, you know. But if you scroll through there, there's a there's not much repression. Nope, that's all gone. If you can have everything, what do you want? You can do whatever you want, but what should I want? If the salt loses, like what? What do you do? <sighs> it's like it's like in the old days. Gather around, children. <laughs> in the old days, we used to have video stores where you would go in and you would look at the big stack of VHS video cassette recordings and you could get any of the ones that you wanted. And you would be there for an hour, especially if you took, perhaps you took your lady friend mm -hmm. to try to pick out a movie. And you're like, I think we should watch the Rutger Hauer film Lady Hawk. <laughs> well, I want to watch Mr. Mom. What about Teen Wolf? No. You have all the choices in the world, but no particular reason to choose any of them. And it just leads to not doing anything. He says that Christianity offered a, an assurance in its asceticism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Asceticism is no longer discussed. Can we talk about how disgusting these people are? Can I read you a little chunk out of a Daily Mail article about D.H. Lawrence? Oh, sure. D.H. Lawrence of Lady Chatterley's Lover fame. Yes, a Freud hanger-on and a follower. When I say follower, not necessarily was he Freudian, but he followed on him and attempted to build you can go to uh what is it chapter seven i think chapter seven the article on daily mail uh, dot com may 14th 2021 dh lawrence's steamiest story of all his wife's lawrence had first set eyes on frida in 1912 already a published novelist he decided on a whim to find work as a teacher in germany and approached his former university professor for a recommendation professor weekly who lived near nottingham and with his 31-year-old wife and their three children, invited him for Sunday lunch. But Weekly was finished, finishing something in his study when Lawrence arrived, which meant Mrs. Weekly had to entertain him alone for half an hour. In those crucial 30 minutes, the novelist decided that the professor's wife, with her blonde hair, green eyes, and large bosom, was his destiny. What did they talk about? Lawrence told Frida that after a few sexual misadventures, he was finished with women. She laughed and was soon chatting merrily about her favorite subject. As she later encapsulated the philosophy that drove her, 
fanatically, I believe that if only sex were free, the world would straight away turn into a paradise. Whether Frida's husband shared that view is unlikely. He met her on a walking holiday in Germany and married her in 1899. On the return from the honeymoon, he told her parents, I am married to an earthquake. Within a few years, <laughs> Frida had her first affair with a lace maker who would drive her to Sherwood Forest so she could run naked through the trees. Another lover was a cocaine-addicted schizophrenic. A third was an anarchist railway worker. And now she'd landed an intense 27-year-old novelist who appeared to worship her. They met again, just twice, before agreeing to travel together to Germany. It hardly mattered that Lawrence had no money, no job, and no home. As far as Frida was concerned, she was having just another affair while she had paid a visit to her parents. But Lawrence was in earnest. He wrote to Professor Weekly to tell him that they loved each other. Mrs. Weekly, he declared, is afraid of being stunted and not allowed to grow, and she must live her own life. From Germany, they traveled on to Italy, where she, he worked on a novel Frida named The Rainbow, because rainbows composed from fire and water symbolized their union. She was a full-flowing stream, and he was a burning flame. Oh, my God. Frida was all too often drawn to other flames. One chance came on their honeymoon when they were walking in the mountains with bisexual novelist David Garnett and his good-looking pal Harold Hobson, a drama critic. Later, Frieda told Lawrence that Hobson had taken her in a hay hut one day. It was the second time she'd strayed that summer. Back in Germany, she'd slept with an officer in Metz. Lawrence shrugged. Who was he to stunt her growth? Yet even her sexual antics couldn't mitigate Frieda's genuine distress at being separated from her children, then aged 12, 10, and 8. Lawrence, she recalled, hated me for being miserable. In revenge, I did not care about his writing. In fact, he was jealous of her children, wanting all of Frida's attention for himself. Mothers, he told her in all seriousness, must relinquish their spawn, and the sooner, the better. Huh. The Rainbow was published yeah. a year after the Lawrences married, by which time they were living in London, now widely viewed as a masterpiece. It charted the sexual awakening for three generations of women. Yep. Welcome the Therapeutic. Could have used some repressions. Don't want to stunt her, you know, because if she was stunted, Hobson couldn't have taken taken her in that hay hut. Stunting. Okay, so interesting metaphor. Stunting is something that you do to a plant? No, it's something you do in a biplane. A critter? No, I don't mean that. I mean to, oh. like, stunt your growth. Right. Let's look up the word. To stunt. Yeah, she was like a sexual bonsai tree. To hinder the normal growth, development, or progress of. Okay. From Scandinavian origin, of course, because it sounds so cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, so that means that there is a normal growth, development, or progress that this person could have had. But how do you know what the normal growth is? Normal, you know, so she's stunted. She's not being all she should be. Now, you see how I stopped and made that value, that value term creep in there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't say she's stunted unless there's something that she should be. So now we've stepped out of the therapeutic. And D.H. Lawrence is saying, well, what he means is she ought to be my sexual toy. That's what she ought to be. So now we have, again, these, uh, these ought words creeping in which is not therapeutic. I don't think D.H. Lawrence thinks it is, but this is why metaphysics is important. This is why mm -hmm. ethics is important. What do we mean by a human being? What is a human being? What is a human being supposed to be? Well, anything you want. No, nope, that's the analytic answer. Doesn't work that way. If you, if you go with the analytic answer, then you can't say she's supposed to be anything. All of her choices are then equally good meaning not good at all. Hmm. So you have to have some idea of a human is a particular sort of thing that, and when it's doing well, this is what we mean. Well, the analytic doesn't allow you to have genuine evaluative terms, I don't think. Maybe you could have well-adjusted, but even well, what does it mean to be well-adjusted? Right. So the good term... Jung calls it the God term. The good term creeps in. It always will. I remember, I, uh, gosh, I forgot his name. I should dig it up. But there was a, an orthobro <laughs> bioethics <laughs> professor that I met. Orthobros. These are the orthodoxy or deaf people. Um, he was also a sheriff in Texas. 
I think he probably was carrying his firearms when he came to the conferences, would wear cowboy boots and a hat. And he's uh, giving his talk and he's saying, and this is in the end why it's uh, it's super important. Well, he would say you had to have a religion. You better pick the right one because without it, you can't do ethics. For him, the right one was his particular Orthodox church. But you, if you don't have that, then you can't. If you're stuck in Freudianism, I feel like I'm making a speech. If you're stuck in Freudianism, there's no right or wrong. Well, how do you feel about that? How do you think about that? Do you think there's no right or wrong? Do you really think that? I don't think you do. I think there's a crypto religion hidden somewhere in you. Crypto Be good to religion. figure out what it is. <laughs> right. And see if it's a well-formed one or whether you want to go be a, a Jungian and work out your archetypes or even a Jordan Petersonian and clean your room or, I don't know, go to church or become a Buddhist and meditate. I don't think you really don't think there's any value in the world. I don't think you agree with Freud. I don't even think Freud agreed with Freud. No. The Daily Mail, Carl. <laughs> yes. I clicked on that to read that little chunk. I'd seen that about D.H. Lawrence. Degenerates. Over here in the margin, Casey Musgrave says she could have coasted in her marriage for years had the pandemic not happened. Uh, last July, the 32-year-old singer and her husband, Rustin Kelly, filed for divorce after nearly four years of marriage. Now listen, this is the therapeutic right here. This is all it right here. I could have coasted for another couple of years, she says, noting that she was just not paying attention to my feelings or not really dealing with some things. Musgraves, however, started asking herself some hard questions while in quarantine, including, why did I make these decisions? How did I get here? How can I prevent myself from getting there again? Why do I keep choosing the same kind of people? I felt in many ways on top of the world in my career, but in my personal life, I felt like I was dying inside, she shares. I was crumbling. I was sad. I felt lonely. I felt broken. I think that I am going to uh, deny and dishonor her lived experience. <laughs> But you like her music. I uh, used to. What about the fact that you're married? Like, does that require anything of her? Or is it all about this pleasure where the psychological man is born to be pleased? Like, is that her highest value is to be pleased so so that now she can just ignore the fact that she's married? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what it is. I felt like I was dying inside. What are you talking about dying inside? What does that mean? Like, it doesn't even mean anything. This this stuff has just changed the way people talk about things, the way they experience stuff. We're hosed up, buddy. What are we going to do, Carl? Become Nietzscheans? Uh-oh. And establish a new order of meaning in the world? I don't know. Leap into volcanoes like Empedocles? Or is that way no longer open to us? Do you read a book like this and you're like, yeah, he's right. He's right. All of his analysis is right. There aren't great meanings. How do you get it back? That pendulum's not going to swing back. He called it somewhere in here, cultural suicide. Page seven, the most elaborate act of suicide that Western elect intellectuals have ever staged. Well, something will come. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know how you get it back. You probably can't. Probably... You can't do it on a societal level. I think probably McIntyre's answer is the answer. It's kind of the Benedict answer. You make your community. Localism. Cultivate the meaning within that community. You can't do it for the greater one. It's just not going not gonna to work. So Freud and Shakespeare, according to my <laughs> Brickian theory, changed the wider society, Carl. Civilization mm -hmm. and his discontents, you know, he, he he shows us why people are discontented. Cannot a uh, a great thinker save us in that? You know, if if he could bring us around to society around over a hundred years to his way of thinking, so that Casey Musgraves feels like she's dying inside because she's married to this poor bastard. You know, cannot somebody else? You know, what about his feelings? How do you think he feels? Shouldn't we consider his feelings? In modern uh, marriage counseling? No. I do not think that reason, this is Carl talking, this is Carlingian, I do not believe that reason is the way forward. 
Um, no, wait I've minute. joked around was, that I'm a Platonic Nietzschean. Was Freud which, reasonable? Was he reasoning in this way that you're talking about? I, I think so, but it's okay. easy to tear things down with reason. It's hard to build things up. Right. Reason is a very destructive force. To make it constructive is different. To make it constructive is a project of rhetoric or beauty. Mm-hmm. I think the way forward, if anyone cares about going forward, is build communities that lead beautiful lives. Don't expect that you're going to rationally convince anybody because there'll be people who, they'll come up, they'll have a whole line of actuallys that they can say back to you. Well, actually, Freud showed that. I feel like I'm dying inside. Yeah, and, and you just say, okay, and then you get back to leading a beautiful life with your beautiful family. Yeah, can you imagine you're this poor guy and you're married to Casey Muffs Graves, piping hot, and she says, uh, Carl, you're married to Casey in this example. Oh. Okay. She says, Carl, I feel like I'm dying inside. I don't want to be married anymore. What do you say? I've done my very best. The how the home is comfortable. I care about your parents. I haven't stolen from you, hit you, mistreated you. Well, Casey, what did you think marriage was? Yeah, because this what little bit I've read about this, she doesn't allege any that he did anything wrong. Yeah, he might have. I mean, it might come out that he was putting cigarettes out on her and shit. I I, I don't know, but some. I mean, we have this thing called no fault divorce now. I feel like I'm dying inside. Here's your papers. I'm out. <sighs> they probably didn't know what they were doing when they started. Yeah, uh, if marriage is a mutual feelings reinforcement society. <laughs> you know, yeah, things are different. I'm trying to look on the right side of this book. Casey Musgraves. Casey Musgraves. Carl, she says that her new album is inspired by Daft Punk and Weezer. Casey, what are you doing? She needs to mind her own biscuits. Yes. What in the? I don't know. She can do whatever she likes. I probably won't listen to it. I did like that Neon Moon cover she did, even though it had that kind of techno beat to the, behind it. It was like her singing on that track. Oh, my Lord. Little, sad little girl voice. A sucker. Mm-hmm. So, all right, structure of the book, I guess. Um, he talks about... Well, no, I want to dig up this quote. Sorry, I just found a juicy one. Page 48. Mm-hmm. A man can be made healthier without being made better. Rather, morally worse. Not the good life, but better living is the therapeutic standard. Yeah, he talks about, this is right around the part of the book where he's talking about economic man. Where people talk about living better. Yeah, he says Americans no longer model themselves after the Christians or the Greeks, nor are they such economic men as Europeans believe them to be. But they are seeking this... uh, this sort of better living. And he says that the Americans have embraced this Freudian ideal more than anybody else and have pathologized it more than anyone else. Not so sure that's true. I mean, uh, I don't think European culture is doing super well. And I don't know about the rest of the world. Well, I don't think their culture is doing super well, but has any culture embraced that sort of self-talk like we just got out of Musgraves there, like the American middle class person has. I don't know, probably not. You know, is there some, you know, French cubicle dweller talking about that kind of stuff? Well, there's a side effect. So I'm I'm going to pull another quote from Philip here. Uh this is from 51. We can t- tie it back into Miss Musgraves. The therapeutic cannot conceive of an action that is not self-serving, however it may be disguised or transformed. Your relationships to others, it's all, well how does that help me? So you were talking about their marriage. I don't know their marriage. I I don't know what's going on. So if she's a listener, she's probably not. But if she's a listener, Casey, call in. We'll talk. We'll do a live show and you can call in. Best of luck, little sister. (laughs) If if you think of marriage as being self-serving, well, then this is a perfectly rational thing to decide. Well, I'm no longer being served. I feel like I'm dying. I need to get out. Well... If your only basis for the success of the marriage is how you're feeling, not the good of the family. I don't know if they have any children. They don't. 
Well, you say that the self isn't being served, but is that, I don't think that's true. You know, I've got an 18 year old daughter. I got on to her the other day. I said, Hey, listen, I'm not going to tell you when you need to be home and all that kind of stuff. You're a good kid, but I do want you to tell me when you're going to be home and uh, call and check in and stuff. So I can just, you know, make sure you're okay. Cause if I expect you to be home at midnight and you're not at home at 1245, I probably need to go looking for you. Your mom and I do that. Like we're in our forties and I'll call her and tell her I'm headed your way because we're watching out for each other. And I said, and until you're married, you need to check in with us so we can help watch out for each other. You and I, Mm -hmm. anyway, this marriage stuff serves all kinds of purposes. Like who's she going to check in with? Like when she has an appendectomy, he's going to take her home. Like what's going on? What is she like? She says it's not serving, but Reef says the self improved is the ultimate concern of American culture. Like she, she's not worried about these real, these very concrete things that you get from the partnership of being married, married, you know, the division of work, somebody to ch- check in with when you've got a car trip or, you know, she's not concerned about that. It's the self improved. Like, you know, do I feel, how do I feel inside? You know, what's my experience of me like inside being in this marriage? Poor Casey. Mm-hmm. How would you like to be a, a, a country western singer songwriter and have these two middle aged guys on this book show shitting on you? Uh, Casey, I only say this because I care. I do too. I've enjoyed your music. Oh, Biscuits is such a good song. What is it? I like Smoke Break. Uh, Blowing Smoke. Yeah, Blowing Smoke. I like that one. I've listened to like three of her albums start to finish. So I'm a fan. But um, I think you might be doing it wrong. You end up having therapies of commitment to try to save this analytic theory from its meaninglessness. Jung is the first one he talks about. And Jung has, you're supposed to live out these archetypes. You're supposed to find the God below, the God underneath you your mythical archetype and your live according to that. You're going to give yourself meaning. I don't find that very compelling, but you could understand why you would want to do that because you end up, it's four o'clock in the afternoon or three o'clock in the afternoon and you're a well-adjusted human being, but what should I do? This is the Peterson project, right? Pick up your room. Here's a story about Tia Matt. He's looking for meaning where there isn't any, frankly it ends up being a mess. So if you're Jung and you're like, live out these archetypes, like which ones? And then how do you evaluate those? Well, whichever one you want. Well, which, how do you know what, that you want it? What about it would make you want it? Why do you keep asking difficult questions? I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's <laughs> bottom one of seven in Jung psychology was transformed to, into an inventory of traditions from which culture could borrow variety and relieve the boredom of an unspiritual, though, comfortable life and my note is non-real salvation so somehow i'm going to make the stories into salvation and by salvation i don't mean the literal christian salvation i sure hope that's true but even if it's not true salvation you could think of it as a sense that my life will have been worth it yeah everything's gonna be okay Yeah, I hope that's literally true. But even if it's not literally true, you need to believe that it's true. Or, you know, what do you do with your life? Other than that, it's it's nihilism. You're a nihilist, Lebowski. You don't like that movie, do you? Eh, Didn't do much for me. Carl, I told you what I wanted. I told you what I want. I don't want these movies. I just want to read like these three books. Like stack firewood, make out with my old lady. Mm-hmm. That's all I want to do. My complete Plato, my complete Aristotle, and some Aquinas. So, and stack firewood, and make out. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get it. It's like music. I just want to listen to Beethoven. Yep. So we just did a music and ideas show about Clifford Brown studying Brown, Max, Max Roach Quintet. That paled to Beethoven for you was tough? 
No, I, I mean, Clifford's pretty good. What I mean, so I listen to a lot of classical music, and the, the, the site that I'm on recommends things to me, and it will recommend some Strauss, right. Richard Strauss, and I, I listen to it. It's all right. It's all right, but it's no Beethoven, you know? Right. There's a few people that are almost Beethoven. I mean, I like Tchaikovsky. It's super pretty. It's still no Beethoven. Edward Elgar, real nice, not Beethoven. You know, it's like it's like I could be listening to, you know, Beethoven. Symphony Number no. Six or the the piano sonatas, which to me are just. It's like there was a, a peak in classical music, and you get to the Romantics, and it's just it's, it's already been done, and it they did it better than you. Scriabin. Yeah. He's interesting. Yeah, that is an occupational hazard. You start reading and listening carefully. And the things that you thought were great aren't necessarily as great. Yeah, like Freud saying that life and death having no value or you know, objective value or meaning. Like, wait a minute, guy. You can't be saying stuff like that. Yeah, you've got a whole stack of books that you've read to counteract this and to say, well, Freud, have you considered uh, the argument for motion? Have you considered the fifth way of Aquinas? I think that would be a good one for you. You know, have you read Aristotle's metaphysics? Have you read the Republic? How about Augustine? You know, have you read this stuff about there being meaning in life and ways in which really smart people have figured it out? Uh, nope. Right. I have transcended them. Yeah. You know, I've been, I think I've griped about Francis Bacon on six of the last eight shows, read his new Organon. And he says in the beginning of that thing that, you know, he'd read Aristotle. And when he was 14, he knew Aristotle was full of it. He had legitimate complaints about how Aristotle treated some sorts of data and how Aristotle relied on the senses in a way that a guy like, um, well, well, Bacon had already run into instrumentation, you know, like good thermometers and compasses and some stuff like that. You know, you know, he he needed to make room for some of those kinds of things. But, but you know, these just these sort of offhand remarks that these guys make like, make my hair stand on the end, makes my spidey sense tingle. They need to they need to back it up. What's what he says? Objective. <laughs> I'm looking for their. Scratch paper, because they need to show their work. There probably needs to be a censor. <laughs> I hate to say that. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, uh, I'm the one that'd be censored right now. If I ever said anything or had any actual opinions, which, dear listener, I don't. So, back off. Well, I, I think you just said it, though. There are censors. There is always a censor. Like, I think that's one of his main one of his big arguments is that there is always a censor or there are always repressions or permissions they are always there it's just what are they going to be and in what in 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 what higher service are they yeah or to quote the the guy that i can't remember his name because his book's in the other room there's going to be a religion you better pick the right one how dare you <laughs> Yeah, I'll get that guy's name for you. I think you'd find him interesting. Uh, How important is this book? This book? Mm -hmm. um, in other words, do the listeners need to read it? Mm -hmm. Probably not. It's damnably hard, I thought. Yeah, it's tricky. If you don't know the jargon, it's, it's tricky. Uh, I think it's an important book. It's an important diagnosis of modern society at least up to 1966 and i'd say probably up through early 90s 2016 um if you like alistair mcintyre i think it's a good thing to have read you'll understand his talk about culture much more if i had read them in reverse i would have found mcintyre much easier mm, interesting yeah the mcintyre book i think is the mcintyre book we keep referring to it after Virtue by Alice Dare, A L A S D A I R, McIntyre. Uh, his book After Virtue, I think, is mighty important. Mighty mm -hmm. important. I don't know that there's anything terribly new in there, but he's a keen observer, and it, it was a big deal to me. I'm glad I read it, and I will probably reread that book every 
five or eight years from here out. Uh, and this one's awfully important too. I don't know if it's that important. I don't know if, if he had some prescriptions in it and they were good, I would put it up there with the McIntyre book, but he doesn't, he doesn't have any, you know, maybe McIntyre's the capstone to this perhaps. Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't Part say two. this, but because he, you know, Reef, at least as far as I can tell from this book, is not an Aristotelian. He is not. He doesn't talk about the purpose of man. Yeah, that's just not part of his project. And so, so if you read this and you see all the problems that are outlined here, and how you know pleasing the self is the highest ideal now, and that the the self improved is the ultimate concern of modern culture, uh, but they're trying to improve the self without a higher ideal, without a purpose. And then you go read the McIntyre book and you say, yeah, 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 that's all true. And, and, and the purpose is the problem. But you know, Carl, the more of this stuff I read, the more I say, you know, none of this is the problem because the problem, the real problem is modernity. (laughs) Starting from bacon. Mm, probably old Marty Luther Martin Luther yeah the father of progressivism (sighs) he wouldn't think he was I know but he is they're like hey listen you read it and you figure out what it means and then you read it and then you figure out what it means and then you read it and you figure out what it means (sighs) So, Carl, you weird trad cath guys. Yes. I'm going to be the listener. Like at the beginning of the show, we were talking about these, um, uh, oh my gosh, uh, soteriological <laughs> processes. Yes. And you, and you had talked about, you had talked about confession. We call them sacraments. Right. Yeah. And you had talked about confession, and I think that widely it is believed that confession allows the confess a war to waltz in there, spill their guts, walk away relieved and unchanged. And, uh, it's a get out of jail free card and is much in fact, like therapy. I think that is a popular, popularly held opinion of that. There are similarities to therapy, and in fact, it 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 bugs me a bit when it becomes that, because that's not what you go there for. There's, okay, since you're a dear listener, dear listener, it should not be therapy. It is a sacrament. What you're going there for is because you think that the priest, somehow, through the grace of God, has the ability to absolve you, which means wash away from sin. Okay, and your conditions for doing this are you have to have contrition. It doesn't have to be perfect contrition. It can be, I'm sorry because I don't want to go to hell. That'll work, but you have to be sorry. And then if you're not sorry, it doesn't work. It would be a sacrilege if you go in there and you're not sorry. Uh, if you go in there to brag. But the whole point of that is the moment at the end when when the priest does what Jesus is supposed to have done, which is forgive sins. Okay, That's the thing that you're actually going for. The conversation before then is beside the point. And there is, in fact, sometimes it's therapeutic. Sometimes the priest wants to talk. I usually don't want to. Uh, sometimes you're in line and, and like somebody in front of you is in there for half an hour and you're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Is this a serial killer? If you're a right. serial killer and you're trying to remember how many times you've killed, maybe you need to be in there a half hour. Otherwise, say what you did, say you're sorry, you know, be brief, be bold, be gone. There are other times and places for that. In my particular tradition, there's something called spiritual direction, where you go talk to the old monk, and it might not even be a sacrament. You just go talk. There is something in that. But that's not a soteriological practice, just talking. Just talking doesn't necessarily do anything. Just talking uh, could potentially look a whole lot like community. Like mm-hmm. you know, maybe these people go talk to uh, Freud or whoever, whatever Freud-like animal, because they don't have anybody else to talk to. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Gosh, I don't. Where was Freud? Was he in Germany? Vienna, right? Austria. Yeah, Austria. 
I don't know if they had suffered such a decline in general friendship as we have. Probably not. Maybe the professional class had, the people he talked to. I don't know. That's, that, that's an interesting question. Kierkegaard is one of my favorites, but I think, boy, you needed to go out for beers <laughs> with your right. buddies. Right. You're a little weird, Soren. You're a little bit of a creature of the night <laughs> sitting up there and writing. <laughs> uh, gosh, uh, Mishima, too. He needed to get out and chat with normal people, not disciples. I think. You know, seminar at Online Great Books, or if you have a book group at your home and you do a good job of seminar, there's a little element of the talking cure in there. You, know, you talk about important things. I tell people when I do orientation, I'm like, this is big talk. It's the opposite of small talk. <laughs> I like that expression. If we're going to talk about how about them cowboys or the weather, whatever. But if you go to seminar and you talk about what is justice, you know, if you read the symposium and like, what is love? What is the purpose of love? You know, that's big talk. And when you, when you talk to people in a group about in an honest way, you don't lie. And then you listen carefully to them, those people, you end up with the community. See, I hate, I hate all this therapeutic language now. I'm keenly aware of it. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe there's something therapeutic about it. Maybe there's something healing about it. Maybe there's something salutary about it. <laughs> you know, doing that big talk with other people who are doing that in good faith and in earnest with you. Yeah. Let me, I want to go back. So I'm going to take back. I don't think it's therapeutic. I want to okay. argue with myself and adjust the term here. So we were talking about going in the box. Yeah. Please change it. I don't like that term. Yeah. So going in the, even if it's therapeutic, it's not therapeutic. So therapeutic would be Freudian where the point isn't necessarily to correct any behaviors. It is to get you to be well adjusted. Okay. Uh, the talking cure as done in little communities and churches and with your friends, even at the bar talk that is not aimed at making you feel better, but is aimed at helping you do the right thing. So there you are, you're out at the bar with your buddies and you're saying, well, you know, I really like Laura. Casey Musgrave. Yeah. Let's say Casey. You should marry her. You think so? Yeah, you need to you need to put a ring on that. Right, you're awful. That's as good as you're going to do. <laughs> good Lord, Lori. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so th that would be talk that's directed towards your good as they see it. And they might tell you that you're you're full of it when you are. Yeah. Whereas the therapist... You know, this is where I think Peterson's probably a million times better than Freud. Because Peterson would probably tell you you're full of it. Yeah. Clean your room. Yeah. You know? That was my Peterson imitation. I like that. Yeah, you'd say, hey, this is the third time you've come in here and talked about her. And I can't help but notice that, you know, she wrecked your car and she slapped your mom. And, you know, maybe that's not best. Yeah, that's not therapeutic. That's good. This is yeah. good talk. The sort that you want to have. Mere Therapy, that's a good book title or a band name, Mere Therapy. Mere Therapy. I need to get my ship righted and you need to tell me which direction to go. And maybe you need to tell me in a way that I end up agreeing with you, but that ship needs to go the right direction. Yeah, seminar is really difficult. If If this kind of stuff that we're talking about is the standard, right, big talk, is the standard for, for seminar. It's, it's really difficult. We have some, um, uh, I don't know, standards of conduct that, that you wrote, you know, when we kicked this off, we were worried about, well, I was worried about it being like the rest of the damned internet. Like I, I didn't want seminar to, uh, be YouTube comments and people be wacky and mean and so on. And so Carl said, well, this is how we should act. You know, no name calling. Uh, we're not going to talk about uh, living political figures, it's, et cetera. You know, all all good stuff. I've been thinking about adding to it, Carl. Mm. Revising and extending? Yes. Because uh, to do seminar, you have to believe that there is a, such a thing as truth. Because if we're going to talk about important things, 
and we are going to be helpful to each other. And there's somebody in the room that just keeps saying it depends. <laughs> and they don't, they're not trying to pursue what is best and right along with us. You, you really can't do the thing. That's true. You need to have the conviction that the truth is out there. This doesn't mean that you have to believe that anyone in particular has it, but that it's no. out there and we might end the seminar a little bit closer to it. Maybe. Right. Yeah. We don't have to That's agree enough. on what that is. You just have to agree that it's there and it can be had. Additionally, I think that you need to believe that that truth is accessible to any person and that it doesn't require a certain mystery recipe of particular kinds of people to access it. You don't need to be an expert. And you don't need to be a female to learn something about females. The, yes. the identity, you can't, you, you can't have it. Yeah, identity politics not is fatal to conversation. Fatal. Yeah, if a guy reads Medea by Euripides, which will make you want to draw a warm bath and cut your wrists, but but you don't think that a, a man can say anything about Medea because he's not a female and hasn't given birth, then then what is the guy do going to do in seminar? Or when no. Ajax is looming large on the field of battle and you're a female and you've never done armed combat, you know, what can you do in seminar? Like, you know, we, we have to believe that the human experience is, is universal and yeah. accessible to everyone and there has to be truth. But so, so, you know, when seminar is at its best, you know, we bump up against those things in people. Like these core beliefs that, you know, these core, these ways that they uh, try to think about the world, it can be challenging, Carl. I think it's a good thing to do, though. We have these people that are, you know, Seminar One still going strong. Been together for three years? Oh, over three. Three and a half. They find the conversations to be good. Mm -hmm. It is a useful thing for them to do. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they say, it's, it's interesting. You know, it shares something with that the talking cure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, if you're out there, there is a, a lack of friendship. There is there's difficulty in friendship these days. Probably I would connect it to the therapeutic attitude to, where everything is self-serving. So, you know, that's the lowest level of Aristotelian friendship. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're always thinking, what does this person want from me? Th that's deadly. A genuine friendship it would be the third type of Aristotelian friendship, and that's where you have a shared vision of the good, or rather you see the good in the other person and admire that. It's really good to have people like that that you can talk to. And if you don't have it in your normal life, you should try to get it. Yeah. We can facilitate that here. <laughs> yeah, we'll help you buy some friends. <laughs> No, that's no, not, you that's you pay for the books and the and the the seminar leaders. The the friends are free. You know, I have helped people put together home book groups many times, and I have found that people don't know how to host anymore. And I don't mean host a seminar. I mean like invite people over, tell them that we'll be getting together at six p.m. Dress as you'd like, and there will be uh, coffee and cake. Just like host a thing at their home. Like they don't know how to really don't know how to do that or they're nervous about it. You know, I know that that's true because people have told me I don't really know how to do that. I'm like, well, you know, you can have people over for a book group. Like how many chairs do you have? Well, I have, I have a small apartment. I have six chairs. I said, well, hell, I mean, you're going to sit in one of those. Okay. It sounds like you can invite five people. <laughs> like, uh, you know, you want to have a little something to eat or, or, not or well i don't you know and you have to talk them through that shit it's unbelievable need to make an app <laughs> right and like you know if you're not going to have anything to eat there's nothing wrong with that at all but just let people know hey we're going to start at 6 30 catch a bite get a grab a bite before you come over and we'll be meeting at 6 30 till 8 30 and we'll just be talking about this book there'll be four other guys me and four other people than you I look forward to seeing you then they, they don't know how to do that now if they don't know how to do that, 
do they know how to f- do friendship? Do they know how to strike up a conversation with somebody to move to big talk? And, you know, do they know how to do that? No, they don't. They lack in those social skills. That's a big, big, big problem. You know, how are you going to move to that third level of Aristotelian friendship if you if you don't know how to, you know, how to have, you know, cocktail peanuts and some <laughs> olives in a fucking bowl, you know, and have people, you know, dealing with Plato in particular is very good for showing people how to do that and for kickstarting yes. that among groups of people. Plato in particular is really good at that. Iliad's okay. Some of Aeschylus is okay. Some of Sophocles is okay. But boy, that I'm telling you, early Plato in particular, where it's not so heavy. So if you get together with some people and you read, uh, well, you read Car- Carmides, what's the one? Cradleus about language. Just they're, they're ion about art and music. They're kind of light and... You read people asking other people questions. It models it well. Mm-hmm. Models it very well. Well, where should they go if they would like to oh. join us? Hmm. Uh, well, you might go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash podcast and uh, go and join us there. We'll be kicking off enrollment here pretty darn quick. We do it every 30 days anyway. So if it's not open when you go, go ahead and just join the mailing list. And I'll send you a discount code as soon as we do open. We do it every 35 days, actually. We do it every 35 days so we can put everybody in a group. We like to put people in groups of, you know, 15 to 20 so that we can put them, you know, in a seminar and kind of help them put that community thing together. And, uh, yeah, go there and uh, get on the waiting list there. Go start a group at your house. If you don't know how to be a seminar leader, that's okay. Go read, go read Mortimer Adler. He has a list of questions you should ask yourself when you read a book. It wouldn't be a bad thing to do to just print those questions out in your first meeting. Uh, you read a dialogue by Plato and the group of you answer each of those five questions as a group. Like one that of the work. questions is uh, uh, state the unity of the book in a paragraph. Well, if you got four or five, six people and you're reading something complicated, it might take you two hours <laughs> for the group of you to figure out what, what the unity of the work is and state it succinctly. And that can lead to some awfully good conversation. Yeah. Yes. Dang it. People don't know how to do that stuff anymore. Well, we're here for you. I'm not great at it. Quick to yell, Carl. <sighs> Disagree. The, <laughs> the first ingredient is being willing. Yeah. To do it. Yeah. Yeah, Carl's standards of conduct start off with dialectic requires friendship. Wow, I wrote pretty well. Yeah. I haven't read them in a while. Yeah, and I said this in the music ideas thing. We're talking about jazz. How nowadays people don't really talk about dialect, dialectic. They talk about dialogue. We're going to enter into a dialogue about uh, ecumenicism. Wait, what? Wait a minute. Wait, what, what is a dialogue? It's a... It's a set piece. We want to do dialectic. We don't know what the end's going to be. We want dialectic. We want to get closer to the Right. Truth. Dialectic is scary. Yeah. In a good way. Ah. Uh, the Tower Treasure, the Franklin W. Dixon. <laughs> that started you on your dark path to conspiracy theory. Yep. Uh, that'll be that'll be uh, next. We'll break this into probably in uh, two two parts, and then we'll do that one. And then... And then the next book after that will be Lonesome Dove with uh, our friend Brett McKay, member of my home book group. And you might know him from the Art of Manliness website. Are you mad at him for making you read a thousand page book? A little bit. A little bit. It's good. I'm probably going to listen to it on my way. I'm going to go visit uh, some folks in Oklahoma in a week or two. I'll probably listen to it on the way there. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it on Kindle. Thousand pages. You know, he wrote the screenplay for Brokeback Mountain and The Last Picture Show. Mm -hmm. I have read that he is mentioned in the uh, Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, Tom Wolfe book, as being part of Ken Kesey's Hey Pranksters. I did not know that. I read that book uh, 10,000 years ago. Hmm. I haven't read that one. 
I don't need a bunch of I don't need a bunch of uh, nineteen sixty two hippy dippy shit creeping into this. I don't, I don't need that. Well, you'll see. I think it's a really good book. I'm a fan. Okay. I'm wondering what your rants will be. Yeah. I have a few. Don't make me sad. Are you guys going to make me sad? No, the book's going to make you sad. Ugh, I don't need that. I don't, have, I don't need that in my life right now. Well, thank you guys so much for listening to the Online Great Books Podcast. Go get your uh, Hardy Boys number one, The Tower of Treasure, out. Go read that. That's a that's a bathroom read. You can you can finish that one in one good BM and be ready for that show. Now, do I need the 1927 original or the 1959 revised? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. I read the 1959 one, I think. I think we should read the 1927 one. Go out and buy the first edition. Go get an original. How much would that be? Uh, I see a reprint on one of the online stores for 25 bucks. Mm. Yeah, we'll, we'll go read that. That'll be that'll be great fun. Hey, Paul's down memory lane. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you in two weeks. Bye.